the latest tech. People love iPhone, and it's an important part of our daily lives. Interviews. We see far too many products that come on the market that you look at that you say, was a blind person ever even consulted for something like this? Accessibility. The most interesting thing over the last couple of years is the emphasis on gaming uh, and accessibility. This is Double Tap TV. Hi guys and welcome to another Double Tap TV. I am Stephen Scott. And I am Mark Flallow and Stephen, we've got a special guest who hasn't been here in quite some time, mm. probably due to his... Uh, should we call it a accident? That's one word for it, yeah. You could call it an accident. There are many <laughs> words we can call it. Misstep. Um, yeah, weather-related illness. Who knows? Sean Priest, welcome to the show. What happened? Are you okay? Oh, uh, I am fine, thank you. So good to be back. And uh, amongst friends, obviously. Yes, I, I slipped on the ice, that's all. It happens to us all, not just the elderly like me. Well, for those who tune into the Daily Double Tap podcast, would obviously know that you were uh, um, missing for quite some time. You hurt yourself. I did. It's okay to admit that we all make mistakes. We slip on ice. It happens, Sean. It, it happens. Does. But you're on the mend. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure, of course. I climbed and crawled up the steps to the shed, but I'm here, always. Anyhow, welcome to the show. The reason you are here is because we know that in your drawers are chocked full of ancient old technology. <laughs> and the reason I even bring this up, Stephen, is because today we're talking about what's in your drawers. And you meaning anybody who happens to be watching the show. Yeah, that's right. Anybody who's watching, anybody who's listening, anybody who is uh, partaking of what this is. And uh, yeah, you can get in touch. Tell us about uh, what's in your drawers, uh, feedback at doubletaponair.com. We can't wait. Uh, and, you know, we want to know what's in your drawers because uh, we've been rooting through. And to be honest, this is, look, let's, let's be frank. Let's just be totally honest with the viewer here. This is just an opportunity for us to dig out some old tech and reminisce on how great the previous tech of old days was, uh, as opposed to, you know, any kind of meaningful reason for this. Uh, you know, I'm, I've got so much stuff here. Will we, will we dive in? Because honestly, there's so much. I have in front of me, and I have it in my hand right now, my very first Android phone, which has, I, I will say, a stubborn stain on the screen. I have no idea what that is. Um, I, I, let's not go there. But it has, you know, many fingerprints and marks on it. I actually used this, believe it or not, and this tells you how old this is, as a cycling computer when I could cycle. Uh, this is going back about 20, well, not, maybe not 20 years, but certainly 15 years, perhaps. Um, and, you know, I actually used it as that after I used it as a, and it's an HTC. Uh, it's, I think it's an HTC Vive. Very small compared to today's. I'll just hold this up next to my iPhone at the moment and hold it to the camera. I mean, Mark can tell us visually, but I think there's, there's certainly, I mean, there's a bit of a difference between the size of these devices, right? It's not quite half the size. It's about, you know, maybe two thirds of the size of an iPhone mini. Yeah, that's a good assessment, I think. You know, a good assessment to the size of that device. I mean, did you actually use it as a phone at any point in time? Yeah. Yeah, well, it was my main phone for a long time because, of course, before the iPhone or even just around the start of when the iPhone came out, you know, I had a little bit of more vision than I do now and I was playing around with all kinds of stuff. And to be honest, at that time, I was probably more interested in Android because the, the entry point even then was still a lot cheaper. And of course, you could get these phones on contracts. So you could have the phone at almost zero cost and, you know, pay up the phone over a period of time. So, you know, yeah, I had my HTC was one of my first Android phones, but, you know, if I go back even earlier than that, this one will shock you. This is the Sony Ericsson flip phone. I love the click in that. I mean, listen to that. That's a, that is a hang up call, right? I am not talking to you anymore, Marco Flalo. Slam, Ow. that is brilliant. Uh, it was a flip phone, camera phone, media phone as well. You could listen to music. It had the Walkman branding in it as well, if you remember the phones that had those for a while. I do remember yeah. that. Oh, the Walkman branding. Oh, they tried to pull out all the stops on their phones uh, those years. You know, the thing about these is they were so, so well built. Although video calling, early days of 3G, terrible. Absolutely <laughs> awful. I remember once almost standing next to a transmitter for 3G and I couldn't get a signal. You know, things have moved on so much. I mean, Sean, what was your earliest memory of, of phones? Because, I mean, you know, obviously in your case, you, I guess you're using, what, Nokia phones with talks back in the day? Yeah, exactly. Talks back. I like that sound of that. That sounds very good. Yeah, the mobile works, yeah. I think the company was called, did a program called Talks. 
believe it was with an X, so you knew it was cool, that worked on certain models of Nokia phones and other brands as well, but mainly Nokia phones. Uh, the only good thing was the battery life. They lasted for weeks and weeks, but that was only because you didn't use them for anything other than making a call or sending a text. They were awful. We are so much better off now. Sorry, uh, no, no, so I'm not, I'm not accepting accept that, Sean that. Priest, because look, first off, no, I'm not. I mean, I've got my, I've got my Nokia 3310 in my hand. Yes. It had something on it that no other phone today has. Actual buttons. Oh, Remember the days of tactile buttons? Okay, granted, I will say not, no dot on the five, which is terrible. a bit embarrassing for the Nokia. But, you know, what a great little device. And, you know, again, very little on here. I remember the days when the Nokia 3310 got internet and it was called WAP, if you yes, remember. that's right. I can't remember exactly what WAP stood for. Mark, you might remember that, but I, I can't remember the, what the acronym meant. But essentially, <laughs> it gave you access to the web uh, via three lines of text on a green background or a grey background. It was unbelievable. But, you know, that's, that is where, you know, technology has moved on so much. You're right. I mean, battery life was excellent on those devices. I thought the tactile nature. Explain a little bit, though, for those that don't know about the talks side of things, because what did that give you access to as, as a blind user? Well, it depended on the model of phone you had. On, on, it gave you access, basically, to you know, being able to send text using the T9 keyboard. So you could use the number pad to uh, send text, uh, access the menus, uh, the system menus, uh, to pick the ringtone, which is the only thing we ever cared about on these older phones. Um, uh, other than that, it was fairly limited. But I'm saying that, but the actual functionality of the phone itself was fairly limited. So it did give you access to you know, a phone like anyone else. So at the time, it was a real boon. But of course, you had to pay extra for that. And it was at least $200 for just the software on top of whatever you paid for the phone as well. Sean, I know you've got a lot of stuff lined up, so let's take a quick break. This is Double Tap TV. Sean Priest is here with us this week. When we come back, Sean, we're diving into your drawers, as dirty as that may sound. You're watching Double Tap TV. Get involved. Follow us at Double Tap On Air or email us feedback at doubletaponair.com. Double Tap TV will be right back. You're watching Double Tap TV. Welcome back. This is Double Tap TV. Uh, I am Stephen Scott. I am Marco Flalo. Sorry. You know what? I'm so enthralled with uh, all the stuff in front of me, Stephen, that I got sidetracked there. Uh, Sean Priest uh, with us as I well know. this it's week. I know. toy shop in here. <laughs> Sean Priest with us as well this week. Sean, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy to see you back on your feet. You are back on your feet, right? Well, I'm back on my foot. I suppose that counts. Yeah, kind okay. of. It's, it's, it's all good. I'm very well, thank you. Before we took a break, we were talking about phones, and Stephen, you asked me what WAP stand for, W-A-P, which was mm. one of the first ways we got on the internet. Wireless Application Protocol. Oh, wow. Google, thank wow. you. Thank you, Google. Okay, no, credit, credit <laughs> the source. I was thinking it might be like web access something, but I couldn't work out what the P would stand for. Wow, I would never have got that. There's a there's a pub quiz game that, uh, or a pub quiz question no one will ever ask you. Uh, right, Sean, what else have you got there? Because I'm intrigued. But you're the guest here today, so Thank uh, you. tell us what you've uh, got there. What have you been finding in your drawers? Well, it's so, it's so uh, apt because I've just been cleaning out my drawers. And you know what I find the most of? I find bundles and millions and so many of these. And in my hand, I have a power brick for, I don't know what, a laptop, I'm guessing, could be a camcorder, I have no idea. I've got about 100 of these. And also, these, I don't know what you call them, wall warts? These power adapters that plug into the wall and just got a long cable coming off it with, you know, a barrel pin connector at the other end. No idea what it's for either. And they're just all tangled up. It's a nest of power bricks and wall warts. And I absolutely hate them because the thing is, I'm terrified to throw any one of them out because I can guarantee at one point I'll pull out a, a, a device or something. I think, oh, where's 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 this power supply for this? And the other thing is that I'm terrified to plug the wrong one in, even if it fits the you know the the barrel uh, the the barrel pin at the bottom for the power. Even if it fits, I'm not sure it's the right one. And if I turn it on, it might just explode into a shower of sparks and melt. So I'm never going to use these things. And it made me realize that right now, the thing that I love about you know, new laptops or any new device you get now is the USB power delivery. Being able to power anything virtually by USB, like in, in main USB-C. USB-C protocol gives you a much more power to play with 
and you can run your laptop, you can run monitors and displays, you can run virtually anything now off USB um, power supplies. And the great thing about that is that it sorts itself out. One, it's always the same connection, so you, it doesn't matter. And whatever power that device needs, it works it out with the USB uh, charger itself. It decides how much power it needs. It, they have a little conversation. It's all like magic, but the thing is, it's safer and it works. And I love it. I wish that everything in my life was powered by USB. I mean, my kettle, my, my TV, my toaster, everything, because it just makes life so much easier. There, I've said it, and I'm not exaggerating, although I probably am. Yeah, but you say that, but now I have got a drawer full of USB power bricks that I, I, I mean, they, they, who knows what they go with, but, but they all work. You could plug in anything. I, could, I have here a Ugreen, I believe it's called the Ugreen 200 USB uh, power hub. It's got four USB-C ports on it and two, I think, USB-A ports. Now, this is able to supply, as the name suggests, up to 200 watts of power. So this can charge, or uh, sorry, this could run two laptops. This could run, uh, well, virtually anything that I plug into it. And off this one device, which is powered by one kettle lead, by the way, um, I can run uh, my laptops, I could charge my phones. And as I said, it doesn't matter because it works itself. It's intelligent. It works out how much, what device needs what power and sorts it all out. It's fantastic. So what's the benefit do you think in having something like that over all the various cables? Because look, I mean, you do have limitations with this. You can, of course, charge up to a certain amount of wattage in there, but don't you have to be careful how much you plug into these things? There's not really a limitation in terms of, I mean, obviously, if you plug in two MacBook Pros or, or try to plug in a third, you're not necessarily gonna get the best charge there, but it will divvy it up across the devices. That is meant more for like, okay, I've got a laptop, I've got an iPad, got a couple phones, and you're laughing. I wouldn't, you know, bring it for a family of seven and hope that you're gonna be able to charge absolutely everything. You're not plugging a refrigerator into that. I just kind of wonder, because a lot of people are concerned about what they plug into these devices, and I just think, you know, if you're plugging a lot of stuff in is it managing that power for you so you know you're not going to overload it like you could with a power socket they are smart they are smart and they do have a lot of iq in there as they call it or, or some kind of ai in there right. that is controlling the wattage and the distribution of that so you're definitely not going to overload something worst case is you're not going to be able to charge something the way you want it to do you think you could charge one of your uh, phones you've got in front of you there, Mark? Oh, I could definitely charge one of these phones. I just need the right adapter, and unfortunately, I don't think they, <laughs> they make those anymore. But you know what, guys? Let's take a quick break, and let's come back and talk about some of these devices I've got in front of me, because uh, I have some... You want to talk about making us feel old? Yeah, just wait till we come back from the break. Can't get enough Double Tap TV? Subscribe to the podcast and get your fill of Double Tap every day. Visit DoubleTapOnAir.com and follow us now. Double Tap TV will be right back. You're watching Double Tap TV. Hey guys, this is Double Tap TV. I am Stephen Scott, back with you today. I've got Mark Aflalo and of course, uh, Sean Priest is with us today as our guest. Uh, you were mentioning about feeling old, Mark. I know you're gonna give us technology to make us feel extremely old, but before that, before we get to that, uh, I'm gonna show you something really old, okay? So this is... <laughs> It feels like a computer. It is a computer, actually. Uh, so this is a Braille Note device. Now, what this does, and this has taken us back to probably 20, maybe 25 years ago when these machines were all the rage. These are, and I mean, you can tell how old this is just by looking at the ports on the back. You've got like parallel ports, serial port connectors. Uh, you know, the only thing it doesn't have, I think, is PS2 because it's too old. It's the size of a laptop computer keyboard, really, but beneath the keys are those 40 braille cells. The device itself is quite bulky and heavy since it's actually containing quite a lot of AA batteries that are rechargeable. And also it has the, the bones of a fairly basic computer built in. It, do, it doesn't even have an ethernet port in it. It has an RJ11 port, which is basically means you can connect a modem to it, not an actual internet connection. But what this is, is a QWERTY keyboard with a 40 cell braille display and this is something which even today, 20 odd years on, this is still a very popular piece of kit. It's essentially a self-contained note taker. You've got a word processor in here, you've got a calculator, you've got you know, a calendar. You could basically use this as a contacts address book. 
you know, or a diary uh, or your WordPad document. And of course, if you had the technology back in the day, you could print from this as well. I don't have anything old enough to, <laughs> to hook up to this anymore, um, except the power supply, which is in one of those boxes, Sean, with all those other, you know, 8,000 power cables. Um, but, you know, this is a speech to text device. It's also speech or text to a Braille device as well. Um, so, you know, you will be able to uh, hear what you're typing into this and read it on the Braille display as well. Now, interesting timing for mentioning this is because we are about to see the launch next year of the Optima Braille laptop, which will have, in a very similar form to this, actually have a Windows 11 computer built in. Uh, this could never run Windows 3, never mind Windows 11. Uh, and it kind of shows you how far this technology has gone and how far we've moved along with this. So yeah, this is about 20, 25 years old, Mark. Beat that with your phones. Okay, I will beat that with my phone. <laughs> this phone, okay, is the Motorola MicroTAC 650. Now, this is okay. probably the second generation of their I guess you call it a flip, but really the flip only opens and protects the keyboard. Um, back in the day, this was like the hottest phone to have. Analog, back on the TDMA and CDMA network. Did you even have those in the UK? I think not. Anyhow, mm. this was sold until 1989. I'm sorry, released in April of 1989. It had a two-line display and it was one of the first phones that showed you who was calling. The antenna pulls up from the body. There's a little antenna that pulls up. Yes, an antenna to bring all those cancer-generating, dangerous cells away from your head. That's why the antenna existed there. And uh, this was the phone to have. And it had a whole, the whole back of this device, I'm holding it up to the camera now, the whole back of the device had a, had a battery that slid on. And that battery, depending on the size of that the battery, would last no, I'm not even talking days here, guys. You could charge that once and use it for a month, okay? Yeah. Even if you were talking on the device all day. So the overall size of the Motorola was about the size of a modern day smartphone when you hold them side by side. Here it is next to my iPhone. Thickness though, a lot thicker and depending on the battery would get even thicker because there were different battery capacities. When you open the flip, there's a traditional T9 keyboard, which gives you the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, star, zero, and pound. Another two rows of buttons beneath that, recall, store, clear, send, and power, volume, and function, allowed you to access various elements of the phone itself, and a little analog screen there with just two lines of alphanumeric text. It had this proprietary weird connector that slid in the bottom. I, I'll try to find an image and throw it up on the screen here if we could find one. But I mean, that's how you'd charge this device. It even had a charging cradle. You'd slide it in so you can keep it on and see who's calling you. The second one I've got up here, guys, is another Motorola phone. But this one's kind of circa 2013. So this is the Motorola Razr. Now, you've heard of the Razr, guys. I mean, anybody you know paying attention now knows that there's still a new version of the Razr, which is a similar design, but of course, a full touchscreen on the inside. No touchscreen on this bad boy. This had internet browsing, so to speak. I don't even think it was WAP at that point. I think it was some other kind of function where you could just browse things by text. Again, like, you know, your first phone that you brought up at the beginning of the show, Stephen, it had a VGA camera on board and a screen on the front. The phone itself is really sleek and thin. It's about the size of an actual credit card when you hold it up. Now, the battery life wasn't great on this device because the battery fit into this little compartment on the back of the phone, which is about the size of, a, of an old matchbox, but even thinner. So about an inch and a half wide by an inch high. And since it only fit in the back of one side of the device, it really didn't provide that great battery life. So the, the cool thing about this, honestly, was just the size, because this is as thin as, you know, a modern day wallet is these days. You slide it into the pocket and you pop it out, flip it open, it answers the call. And when you're done, just you get that flip. You like that, Stephen. I know Stephen likes I that. I love that sound. You get that sound and you swap oh. it down. But I mean, these are the only phones that I've managed to keep over time. I had so many. I used to import them. There was a Motorola Vader that I'll try to find a photo of for you guys. It was half the size of even this one and had a you know, big stubby battery on the back. And that was the first one that had a built-in, was an answering machine. There was not only caller ID, but there was a built-in voicemail system. And that's what set that one apart. So, so many cool things. 
but this is this is the interesting thing, right? As much as we look at all this stuff and we look at, for example, the tactile nature of it, you know, the, the batteries that were removable, the battery life itself, would we trade all that, all our iPhone tech in today to go back to that kind of model of tech? No. I, I don't know. Sean, what do you think? <laughs> no, absolutely not. The really good thing about those and why we're drowning in nostalgia here is the, the ceremony of it all. That pulling that, that, oh, my phone's ringing. Let me pull out the aerial. And as Steve has said, you know, when you're finished, let me slap it shut to hang up. There was some... Did you just call an antenna an aerial? Is that what they call that, it? That, sorry, sorry. I, yeah, that's, that's what, what we, we call, call it. it. Yes, an yes, aerial, okay. An aerial. Uh, there, there was something about that that made it sort of satisfying. And I do kind of miss that. You know, it's, it's not the same when you magic tap on an iPhone to hang up a call or try and find the end call button. It's not as satisfying. So there was a physical aspect to these. But no, who would go back to this? But I, you know what? I'm going to dig more. I need to do some more spring cleaning. I think you guys should do the same. And we should do this again because this was a lot of fun. Yeah, it certainly was. Um, that's it for today. Thank you to Sean Priest, who, of course, you can check out on the Sean of the Shed podcast. And do we call it vodcast on YouTube? I don't know. Do we call it that, Sean? Oh, absolutely not. No, I don't like that. No, no video no, podcast. Like okay, that's, that's, let's use proper okay, English. Well, okay, check that podcast out. with video. <laughs> Yeah, you can find Sean of the Shed on YouTube, you can find him on podcast, and uh, you can find us again next time here on Double Tap TV. Thanks for watching, guys. Thanks for watching Double Tap. Send us your feedback to feedback at doubletaponair.com. Leave us a voicemail at 1 877 803 4567. Hosted by Marco Flalo in Montreal and Stephen Scott in Glasgow. Producer Marco Flalo. Editing and graphics Jordan Steves. Voiceover Anna Vicino. Social media Wendy Kaufman. Integrated described video specialist M. Williams. Supervising producer Michelle Dudas. Manager programming AMI TV Lizanne Gagne. Director content development and production Kara Nye. VP content development and operations John Melville. President and CEO David Arrington. Copyright 2023 Accessible Media Inc. An AMI original production.